great to be here. I love Cape Town. It's a beautiful place, and uh, this is my favorite conference there is. So um, there's a lot of talk about creativity, and I'm always uncomfortable with the word because I don't think people go out and be creative. That's a very embarrassing thing to do. It's like saying you're going to go out and be beautiful. You really kind of can't do that. I, I think that what creativity really is is this small, defiant act of misbehaving. And it, it comes from generally being in situations where you're, you're uncomfortable with something and that you're looking for another way to do something because you feel either trapped or confined or you're arrogant or you're just generally carrying on. And so for this particular exercise, I put together seven projects, some of which you've seen, some of which haven't been made yet, some of which just came out, that, that all had some kind of defiant moment where I made a small breakthrough that either changed the project or changed the way I worked later. The New Jersey Performing Arts Center, which has been reproduced and everybody's seen, was a result of not having any money for a job, being essentially ignorant about how to solve an architectural problem, and also the major discovery that if you photoshopped a building, it could come out like that. This was the building. It was a school for uh, children studying dance and drama and theater, and they had no money, and uh, they asked me to do something to it, and I essentially photoshopped it. And the Photoshop rendering came out like this. And about a year and a half later, the building, in fact, looked like this. It was painted with typography. It was... Uh, sort of became more emphasized as, a, as an architectural statement because of the photography. It was painted by guys who paint garages and, and made this their most important job. And it has never gotten any graffiti on it because I think that the people who were graffiti artists actually respected the fact that it was so carefully painted. So as a result of it, I began getting these other schools to do. And the... The other schools came with slogans. For example, this is a, a school system um, called Achievement First that exists in New York City. It's its own little charter school system, and in that system, uh, the students are encouraged to excel by all these little slogans that they got as stickers. And I looked at the stickers and thought, well, they should really be walls. So we began painting walls with the slogans, and there was a gym with slogans, and a great big wall with slogans. And this thing became sort of an industry for me, where I have now done five schools with these slogans on walls, and the kids are, in fact, excelling. I guess maybe they don't really read the slogan, but maybe they absorb it, but they seem to be doing incredibly well. The most recent, which just opened, the slogan started to get embedded into tile, and I keep looking for ways where the misbehavior can, can become worse. The kids actually begin to accept this, and now it's sort of the norm for a public school system where it was odd maybe 10 or 12 years ago. So it's not misbehavior anymore, and I don't know quite how to deal with it. But school systems used to be beige, and now they're not. You know, you, you do these things, and you do them out of love, and you do them out of fun, and you do them because you want to do something good. But what's really wonderful is actually when you get to see the result, and that's sort of fantastic. So this is actually another school episode, and this was different. It wasn't a school system where I was hired as a designer. It was an art commission from the city of New York to make a mural in a public school. And I was competing with three other artists and I did not feel like I was qualified to uh, get this commission because I thought the other artists were going to be better and do a better job. 
This is what my paintings look like. I paint these big, large-scale maps that have all kinds of details on them and are, are complicated. And, and the um, architects and the uh, one percent for the Art Commission had seen them and thought it might be a good idea to commission me to do a map of the area where the school was in, which is in Queens in New York City. This was the architectural rendering I was presented, which if you look at this blue spot, that blue square, that was what I was supposed to fill with the map. It was the size of the map. And I looked at it and I thought, well, if I put my map there, that's not gonna win. Also, my maps tend to be loaded with color and that looked like a fairly dark space in the rendering and I thought the map would look too busy in the space. As a matter of fact, I thought the whole thing was a loser. So, so what I decided to do was actually ignore the space and just fill the whole damn thing up with the painting and say, okay, the blue square doesn't count. And I knew I could do that because I'm an environmental graphic designer and I know how to actually fill space with the stuff, which meant I could go down to City Hall with a model. And I knew that the other painters were only going to go down with the drawing. And I thought that was going to be cool. So um, I, I made the map. Um, this is uh, my painting of New York City and Queens. And we broke it up into the space that is the space of the whole building where that mural is, which actually has a skylight on the top and a catwalk around it. And then we broke the painting up into panels because in New York City, the painting has to last forever. You have to be able to remove it in case of a flood. It has to be fire resistant. So it was a repainting of the painting, which we did at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, and uh, it was projected uh, on the wall and then painted. There's me holding the original size of the painting against the giant painting. And then it was, it was uh, projected, repainted, and broken up into tiles. The tiles were sort of giant pieces of... Um, board that were covered with canvas and then slathered with paint and installed. And that was the, the finished mural. There were two of them. And the second mural had the whole area of Queens in a million different languages. And the first mural, the teachers proofread and they, they corrected my spelling mistakes. The second mural, I asked for help uh, actually translating these things, and they said, um, the teacher said to me, no, you're gonna have to translate them yourself. So I got them off Google, and they made no sense at all. I gave them to the teachers, and I said, do you wanna proofread this? And they said, no, 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 that's art. <laughs> this is a project that didn't get completed, um, and it was driven by my dislike for the project, I have to say, the, the, the approach, which I loved where I came out with it, and I'm gonna save it for another project. I, I was asked to do signage and environmental graphics for a shopping street that was a reconstruction of a uh, sort of a New York City Soho street in Las Vegas. And I thought, I, I hate this, and I, I, I don't want to do this. What, I, I had this huge desire just to cover the thing up. And then I realized that in the times that those great industrial buildings were built in Soho, oh, by the way, it was on a shopping street like this, and there was a Ferris wheel at the end of it. I realized that what existed in those days, which is not in this image, were a million telephone poles with wires and cables that were actually part of that period. And that if you had signage on cables, it was potentially possible that you could program it and light it. So I got this bizarre idea of creating sort of layers of cabling that you could attach typography to because it would be like a giant grid that you could light the typography and it would sort of look like neon and that this thing would be something that you could walk under sort of like making a shelter for a shopping center which I thought was going to be amazingly cool and then you could take the surface and in the daytime you would barely see the cables but it would feel like an old city and at night it would look like that um, they actually could never afford it and uh, I think in, in the end, it's probably not that expensive a proposition. However, 
I would have never thought of this except for I had this insane desire to just simply cover this whole place with typography. This is uh, another a sort of a, a solution I would not have come to except for I was in sort of a bind. I had agreed to take on the Type Directors Club um, show and annual, which is actually a lot of work because they do a lot of promotion. You have a, a, a book you have to make sort of quickly at the end, and then you have a series of ads, e-blasts, and website you have to put up, uh, which means that you've got to get somebody on your team on it pretty much full time because it's always going on. The, the problem, the reason it's a staffing problem is not that I couldn't get somebody to do it, but that everybody on my team would want to do it because it's much more interesting than the client work because there's no, you're making it and you're not really dealing with a lot of political problems. So I was looking for a method for how I could actually break this thing up and give it to a bunch of people on my team and have it not worry about how it was managed or whether the, the work looked consistent. And I came ac uh, across this uh, graffiti artist named Barry McGee, and he'd done a series of these concentric paintings that I really loved because the, the form changes, but they all look connected. And I realized it could be typography. So I took the letter TDC and I sort of broke it up into these radiated things and gave them to 12 different kids and said, here are the rules. It radiates, it's red, it's got concentric lines, it has no curves, but it says TDC, design any alphabet you want with it. And I had a bunch of kids all at the same time design these things, which were sort of amazing because they functioned together as identity without really having a solid rule book, like you could actually recognize it as one, as one thing. And then I'd have kids who would come up and they'd, they'd sort of intern for me and they'd be there for like two months and they would do this thing. I see them now in portfolios all over New York, you know, so people drew these TDCs and they were there and then you gave them something else to do and they really couldn't do it. It was sort of an amazing thing that happened with this thing. And I realized that it was really a great way to create an identity system, that you can, in fact, make these incredibly, ridiculously loose rules as long as there's a control of color and a control about form. There's a moment where you don't recognize it. There's a moment if the lines get too thick or too thin, it doesn't quite work. But these uses is, sort of went on forever. And I began, I've begun to actually use it in sort of serious identity application because I, it's, it's interesting to see how far you can stretch something, keep interest, and still have it recognizable. And the project where I think I worked with it to its best effect was actually for Microsoft, only I didn't realize I was doing it. Um, I, I had a, a project that was exactly the opposite of this. It was for a very enormous company on an identity everybody was going to see. Uh, where I had to change both the behavior of a company in terms of the way it thought about identity and the behavior of a lot of individual groups within the company to get them to buy something. And I actually failed and then found that I had succeeded in retrospect. These are all of Microsoft's logos and they were all designed at different times, usually with the involvement of the engineer who designed the software and they had no connection to each other except for the fact that they all have kind of bright colors and they have a lot of, of gradients and they have a lot of um, sort of dimension, which I think the goal was to make everything on the computer screen look dimensional so you thought you could go into it, that you could sort of push these buttons and they sort of would push back. And that's, why, that's my theory about why these things are also kind of roundy. And Windows had designed its Windows 8 software at that time, which is what they called uh, authentically digital, meaning that there are no gradations, that everything is flat. It's a modernist design of a series of squares that you move around. So that the logo really had to reflect the spirit of where they'd gone with their software. So when I looked at this flag that they had, which I, I didn't understand, which sort of looks like four pieces of tile that are bent, that are in dimension, that look like they're supposed to wave. I thought, well, I think what they meant is this. I think that originally it was supposed to be a, a window in perspective, but somebody was in a meeting and they said, well, it doesn't look dynamic enough, it's too flat, it needs to have motion, and that that was what made them sort of make this thing, if you could track back into what, it, what somebody probably said in a meeting. 
And I thought, well, why don't we go back to what they meant? And what they meant was probably perspective, and I sort of took them back through Euclid. And then we looked at this pers perspective drawing about how things are drawn in perspective, and that I realized that if they could accept the notion of thinking about this thing draw as, as a flat drawing, because on the computer and in, in, uh, on the television screen and any other place you're going to see it, it's always going to be in motion anyway, that the thing could be flat and it could be a drawing of something in perspective. And in fact, all their logos could be, that all Microsoft logos could take perspective as a, as a basis and a tool for creating themselves. That means anybody could do it, because you could go to the perspective chart and you could draw your own logo. They sort of didn't understand me, but then I showed them how the Windows logo came out of the thing and then demonstrated how you don't need to worry about it being seen one way because it can always be in motion, that you look through Windows and you see them at all kinds of angles and that all the um, logo is is one freeze frame of a logo that's perpetually in motion. And you can use it as a design thing, and you can think about everything as angles, and you can see through it, and you can make ads out of it, and you can do all this stuff. And that actually got adapted and used. What didn't get adapted and used was a hundred years of fights with Office trying to get them to conform to the, to the, the uh, uh, little perspective grid. They bought the perspective grid, they just didn't like the way I was cutting it up. Bing didn't like it, I couldn't get uh, Xbox to go near it. And yet, over time, as I threw up my hands and walked away and said, take the perspective chart, they began to adopt it. And uh, it was really rather shocking for me. Uh, first, the Windows logo launched, and there, the logo was suddenly everywhere, so everybody accepted it. And here's the Office logo done by Wolf Owens and all the stuff inside, and I guess they're drawing right off the chart. So it's sort of wonderful that you can actually create this thing, dump it, walk away from it, and watch it come to life on its own without your involvement. So this is a job that hasn't been built yet, but I had to show it to you because it doesn't involve any typography at all, and I usually get hired to do typography. Um, what happened was that uh, I was hired by an architect to design the subway station signage in Tel Aviv, which was going to exist in three languages, which are Hebrew, um, uh, Arabic, and English. And uh, the, I was told that I wasn't really going to be able to use or pick a typeface yet because they hadn't sent out the branding RFP, which meant that if I picked a font, the font would have to change, so they didn't want me to use type. And I said, well, well how do I know what size the signs are? And, and they said, well, you'll have to figure that out for yourself. So I was essentially designing blank signs for a system of unknown space and trying to figure out how it was going to work. And, as a result, I did something I think I would never have done before, and I hope they use it because I actually think it's, it's a good idea. The, uh, the subway system, uh, the um, uh, kiosks and all the entryways were designed by uh, a, a, an architect called Samson Grizzen, and they made these beautiful angular shapes that are very indicative of Tel Aviv architecture, which looks like Czech cubism. And I looked at the top of these um, entryways, and I realized if you stood them up straight, they would make terrific signs. And we thought they could be of any size, of any scale, any indeterminate width. They could fold and bend, and they could do a lot of things, and we could figure out where the type went later. That they would look very much like the landscape there because they would cast shadows and there would be a lot of light and dark and play that would work on them that would be quite beautiful because Tel Aviv is a very bright city and there's a lot of light and shadow that exists. That if they bent on the side, they could become directional arrows, which meant that you could probably run an LED through the side and you could have the type run one way or the other way. That you could make seats out of them. You can make little tables out of them. You could put them together and you could make shelters out of them or you could be x-rayed when you go into the subway. 
Little people could walk through them. And they could be any width. They could be fat and skinny and tall, so it didn't matter how much type they had, I'd just make a fatter one. That was sort of the thinking. That you could run uh, where the subways were coming up one of the angles and maybe you could light it. Sort of the, the scale of it, with the LED on the side and the thing on the back. What amazed me about this thing, and I have no idea what will happen to it, is I just never had approached a job like this. And it really came from the most screwed up brief you've ever gotten. <laughs> and I think that that's always wonderful, because that's really where the opportunities come on, I think, when something is just so incredibly screwed up that if you don't do something that you don't typically do, it would never get solved anyway. So saying that, and for the, the last project I'm going to show you, is something that I've worked on for 18 years, which I think is the hardest job I do. Because when you've done something, as long as I've designed the public theater and you go into another season, you don't know if you could actually do it, you don't know if you're right to be doing it, you don't know if you should pass it on to somebody else, and it's hard to rebel against yourself. It's much easier to rebel against somebody else's stupidity. It's very hard to even recognize your own. So I do this thing almost as a test to see if I can get through another year. And what I, of course, became interested in with the public after doing millions and millions of posters was really getting involved in the redesign of their, their new space. And, uh, it opened this year. I've read it. For those of you who don't know, I've, I've been designing the graphics for this theater, which is a wonderful theater that does free Shakespeare in the park in New York City, is the home of Mer Meryl Streep, Kevin Klein, Tony Kushner, and a score of Philip Seymour Hoffman, a score of American actors, actresses, writers, producers, and directors that have totally influenced American theatrical community. I've redesigned their identity three times and nobody knows it because I change it subtly. And uh, then over the past four years, as they were raising small cups of money, we began redesigning their lobby. The uh, posters that we did this year, which sit in their brand new poster boxes, were based on the lobby design and had sort of this red bar across them because there's a, a red fence inside the theater. The theater's colors have always been red, black, and white. Here's the black banner on the landmark building. That's not so unusual, but the awning was. A lot of trouble getting this through City Hall. You can't attach things to landmark buildings in New York City. The inside of the theater has gone digital. There's a uh, display that is a chandelier, um, which was programmed and designed by Ben Rubin. And the uh, chandelier has Shakespeare plays in them, all the dialogue to the Shakespeare plays, which play on these blades uh, back and forth. And it was an interesting experience because I was on the, uh, the board of the public and on the, the architecture committee, so we picked Ben and I forced him to use public theater type, which was very difficult for him because he wanted to use typical digitized typography that he'd always work with when he does these things. But I thought the result was amazing because it, it lives in the lobby and it's part of the lobby and it's part of the public theater language. All the, the furniture is customized, the signage is pushed into the walls, punched out, and lives there in a way that's permanent. Uh, because the building previously was just sort of slathered with posters. And uh, there's just, it's type city. Uh, their biggest goal is, is getting this donor's wall built. Um, the donor's wall is unusual because the way the denominations are organized, instead of having the person who gives the most being in the biggest type, or uh, being at the top of the list, they come out the farthest on this brick wall, so you get a really big brick. So the big, the big issue with the donor's wall was, well, if, if you're below the brick, your name is cast in shadow. So your name doesn't show up as much as the brick that sticks out. So my thesis was, well, that's the point. If you want to get your name to stick out, give more money, you get a deeper brick. <laughs> it's a fundraising wall. Go raise that money. So here it is, and, and, and they're building it. And that's sort of, the, we hope, the future of it. So if anybody wants to give money to the public theater, they can have their bricks stick out. And uh, 
This is what's become of my posters. Uh, they're behind the case in the box office, enshrined in history and rel a relic of the past where they truly belong. Thank you very much.